All right, here we go, gentlemen. Give me a one-word reaction to Eternals. BB Nate, go. Disappointing. Oof. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're starting off hard right off the bat. Samuel the Hutt, you go. Mediocre. All right. Dad, what do you think? <laughs> um, forgettable. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Wow, we were just not nice. <laughs> yeah, we'll explain uh, all of this next on this week's episode. This is Tatooine Sons. It's true. It's true. All of it. What is the name of the Porg on the Millennium Falcon? Force is strong in my family. What do you think his name is? <laughs> it's a big moment. I am a Jedi. Like my father before me. Maybe Turbis? Do or do not. There is no try. Turbis? <laughs> Pablo, if you're listening to this live stream, that porg's name is now Turbis. It's a good Star Wars name. We're not done yet. These guys record an awesome podcast called Tatooine Sons. Everybody was we did mm-hmm. and it was a Marvel movie weekend so it's pretty apparent what we did see actually it's not twice. because usually when we go to a on Marvel movie weekend if we go to a movie more than once it's a Marvel movie, movie. we saw Dune for <laughs> BB Nate you and I saw it the third time Sam you saw it the second yep. Yep. so was that fun that was actually a lot of fun I've been wanting to go back and watch that oh, for a such a good now. movie it is a good movie all right uh, welcome to Tatooine Sons a pop culture podcast, as you just heard. We are the only fan podcast to name a canon Star Wars creature and to be endorsed by the amazing, incomparable Ryan Johnson, who is going to be uh, producing a trilogy on Star Wars again sometime very soon, we hope. He's working on, on Knives <laughs> the Out. Rumor right is, the rumor is it could be very soon, but I don't think that rumor is true. Uh, we believe <laughs> that pop culture is the mythology of our generation, that there is a story. It is written on our souls. And that these myths speak to that story. And that is why we are talking this week about Eternals and the Book of Boba (laughs) Fett and immersive Star Wars Hmm. storytelling. I'm David. I'm the dad. Hi, dad. Hi, dad. Hello, gentlemen. I'm honored to be joined every week by my two amazing sons, BB Nate. Uh, what you talking about this week, buddy? I'm talking about the Eternals and how Marvel had a little bit of a miss last week. You think so? Just a tiny bit. Okay. Do you think that like the world believes the same thing? I think that some of the world believes the same okay. thing. Okay. I think it, this is a more middle split of reactions. Okay. All right, we'll than talk about it before. Very cool, Sam. Where are you going? It's a good time to be a, a Boba Fett fan. Just it's awesome saying. that you were a little dark side in your reaction last week. I was tired that night. Okay. So is, are we a little bit more light side yes. with that one? Good, because yeah. I don't know if we could do a dark side Boba Fett and dark side Marvel in the same, yeah, that, that or the same episode. Uh, what are you discussing, Dad? Well, we had a special interview uh, with a big time Walt big Disney time. Imagineer this last weekend on Potathon 2021. So we're just going to go ahead and play that interview on this episode because it was pretty awesome. Because <laughs> it's just that special. It is. Um, we want to put a, a shout out though before we get into the show um, to our sponsor cufflinks.com cufflinks.com has over 3,000 items on their website from Star Wars Marvel DC Lord of the Rings NFL NCAA Major League Baseball like you can get uh, cufflinks and other memorabilia from the world champion the Braves Atlanta Braves um, <laughs> NBA and everything else that you can think of and of course as we um, mention every time we uh, do an episode we are very really truly honored uh, to be sponsored by this amazing company and if you're listening to this podcast and you have not followed us or subscribed to us on your podcast app um, that'd be cool if you did please we would appreciate it yeah. <laughs> I was going to say something like you know what's wrong with you but that's mm-hmm. not that's, that's me we need to keep the that's dark side right. level like and at I, a minimum I, yeah this what episode. i meant to say was we value you so much that we are heartbroken that you're not following us and and good save 
And please follow us Very uh, PC. on the show. Like uh, this is part of our new schedule that was started up last week. So it's Tuesday morning when you're listening to this. And um, we hope that you will uh, enjoy getting this a little bit earlier in the week, uh, especially as you kind of dig into movie moments and what's coming up the next mm-hmm. weekend mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. Next Friday or this, not next Friday, this Friday, coming mm-hmm. up Friday. in just a few days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going to have um, on my interview with uh, Pete Fletzer from Around the Galaxy. He is one of our favorite Star Wars people. And he and I had a great conversation about growing up with Star Wars and how he grew up with a Star Wars dad. And then he became a Star Wars dad. And yeah. so it's a it's a great conversation. So all you dads and even you moms out there that are listening to this, make sure you tune in to that episode on mm-hmm. Friday. I think it's time. It is um, time. Let's just go for it. <laughs> well, we had a new Marvel movie come out last weekend, and we have some thoughts on it. Let's Obviously. get into them and talk about how this movie didn't feel like a Marvel movie, and not in a good way. Have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight? Yeah, I can fly. I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. The people in this room, which one is A, wearing a spangly outfit, and B, not of use? There's only one God, man, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. Batman has no limits. Podcast uh, text me oh, yeah. this week, and he was like, he's a big Marvel Comics guy, yeah. Um, and and he was trying to figure out who Black Knight was. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I even so, kind of knew who he, he was. was. Like, Try, help me understand who that is. <laughs> uh, and he and then we, I took. He knew about it once I explained. You know, oh yeah, I remember. And he actually has some of the run for. The, oh, okay. But yeah. Anyway, it's not a very popular character. Mm, it is not. So initial reactions: one to ten Eternals. A scale of one to ten because yeah, there's ten members on exactly. the team. Exactly. Well, you know, maybe. Um, Sammy? <laughs> Six. Okay. Six, yeah. Dad? Quickly, you gotta give a reason why though. Oh yes. Um It wasn't a horrible movie by any means, but for a Marvel movie, definitely a letdown. Dad? So you're saying it's kind of like a DC movie? Oh, no. I'm just oh. picking on you, BB-Nate. Ah. No, it had to use DC as a crutch. Oh, yeah. Ooh, jeez. Okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going five. Ooh. Right. Um, I I think that the the writing in it was confused. Um, I don't think that. Um, I heard another podcast talk about this today, and when they said it, it really triggered. So I'm just go ahead and give you guys a shout out. If you're not if you're a Marvel fan and you're not listening to the Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. You should check them out. They're pretty awesome. They're probably more knowledgeable than us. They know a lot about Marvel, and one of the things that they were talking about was that there's no point of view character. In this. There yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and so it's hard to follow this movie because it just keeps shifting between ten different points of view um, throughout, and so and that's part of the the problem with it. I just I don't think they even knew who the villain was uh, in this movie. So anyway, we'll talk about all. I that think actually. many of us did. Um, yeah. yeah, I'd give it a, a five. I just I think that I was the one being generous. <laughs> where I just I had I always was concerned about this movie ever since I heard of the director and my concerns were met. So yeah, you keep saying that explain to me why I'm explaining later. Okay. I'm cause explaining cause later. you, cause close out is a great director. She's fantastic. That, she won an Oscar. She won Oscars. She won best picture. She's an amazing director, but I'll get into it okay. a little later of why I think it was a mistake. All right. Um, Nate teasing things. Yes, here. I yeah. know. Right. So keep track. <laughs> Eternals didn't hit the mark for us in every way, but what were some ways it did work for y'all? That's okay. a great question. Yeah, it's good to focus on things like that. Um, I think I've spent so much time dogging on it that I haven't really given it any thought. Um, I will say I'm excited for the Black Knight character, I think. Okay. Um, that is something that I think could be really interesting in the future. And they've got a good actor playing the role. I know he was in um, Game, of Game of Thrones and Thrones. stuff. Yeah. yeah, But from what I saw in this, he's a good actor and I feel like he'll fit well in the MCU. And I'm excited to see more of that really, I mean, even like... Um, Lucas said it's a, it's a pretty vague character. So I'm excited to see more of that. That's cool. Um, I think visually it was stunning and we kind of knew it was going to be from the trailers. Um, 
uh, other things I liked about the movie. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, we'll talk about it. I'm sure later on. I really liked Gilgamesh. I thought he was a fantastic character. He's, oh, yeah. he had the most heart in the movie. Um, and I really enjoyed, uh, that character and the relationship mm-hmm. that he had with Thena and his willing to willingness to, uh, mm-hmm. kind of give up everything for her. So, uh, those things I really liked about that movie. Definitely. I mean, yes, it was a very beautiful movie, good CGI, well shot. It had, the movie had some funny moments. I mean, there not all the jokes landed, but if you did, I mean, if you got a little bit of, yeah, but when you can sit in a movie theater and you've heard two of the jokes, the main jokes in this movie so many so times many word. that you can literally predict predict the when moment people, are, people are going to laugh like we would do it during the trailer i would do it yeah me too during yeah, the trailers with the vibranium like, thing yeah the vibranium ikea or, or what is it fall collection ikea, IKEA yeah and then <laughs> I, would, I would i would flip my hand in the air like in a in a spin as people would laugh yeah. because that's the moment right right, right. that was a challenge for this movie so. it was yeah. it really was and i mean the action was good at some points i felt like a few of the action scenes were just thrown in there to be thrown in there but Still, you know, it was good for a Marvel movie, a good good action. But yeah. with a cast of ten Eternals, we were bound to like at least one of them. So, yeah. who was y'all's favorite? I mean, Eternal? I just I think it, it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was Gilgamesh. I think that Gilgamesh is he, he in just he really didn't have a lot of scenes and a lot of no. a lot of dialogue. It was so sad. But that moment when Thena is having the mad weary. Medbury, yeah. Uh, situation uh, in Babylon, and they're talking about wiping her brain or or whatever. Is it? Isn't it's that wiping her memories? Yeah, wiping her memories. Wiping again. her memories all over. Which why is everybody afraid of wiping her memories? That's what everybody else did. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, but I guess they didn't know that at the right. Time. Yeah. At so the time. okay. So um, but but she's worried about it, and they, she doesn't want her her memories wiped, and Gilgamesh, who's you know, a mythological character. The epic of Gilgamesh is a big deal. I loved that idea. That's something I loved about this movie that I wish they would have done more of. There are Athena as, you know, Athena yeah, as they Athena. Explain, like these Icarus, characters. Mm-hmm. Gilgamesh, all of these different characters. Cersei. Cersei. They can all be mythological figures. I just wish they would have gone they down. They explained where Icarus came from, but they didn't really do it much but with I the don't, other ones. Here's, here's a great part of writing, okay? If you can show me, show me, don't tell me. They could have shown, they showed stories being told. Mm. They should have cut out some of the other fluff that was in this movie and shown Sprite telling that story about Icarus in Greece mm-hmm. leading to the legend of Icarus instead of saying she told the story in Greece about Icarus. Yeah. yeah, Right? I mean, those are the types of things. But Gilgamesh is an amazing character and that moment when he realizes that he he cares enough for, for Thena to sacrifice his own independence to go into seclusion with her to protect her and protect everyone else that was a really emotional mm-hmm. moment and then it was funny at the same time emotional when we get reunited with them again and he's wearing that silly apron that yeah, says Gilgamesh and oh, stuff yeah. like that on it and he's making pies in stone ovens and he drops it and and then you realize yeah this is fun right but then you see a, you see Thena off by herself, and he's injured mm-hmm. because he was trying to protect her from herself and protect himself from from her mad weary again. Mm-hmm. And this is a really amazing character. Mm-hmm. I just didn't like what they did with them. So, yeah, so. yeah. I I, got, I agree with everything you said. You you put it all the best. Like what happened? Well, I mean, there was the moment where they were finding that like bowl deviant or whatever and he just like slaps it in the face (laughs) that was cool but i mean yeah the moment when they open the door in australia and they see him and the first thing i noticed were the cuts on his arms and stuff and it took me a second to figure out what that could be from but then i realized he's been having to deal with thena and her mad weary and he doesn't draw attention to it it's no big deal he's got major wounds but it's not a big Mm. deal because he cares so much about thena and he's willing to take care of her no matter the sacrifice and he's still got a, you know, chipper personality about it. He's like, y'all want pie and stuff. You know, he's still chill about it, but it's, it, it, you can tell he, he, it takes a toll on him. Yeah. yeah. It was a really well thought out, well, def- uh, well written character for the short time that he was in mm-hmm. this film. Yeah. I mean, I think we all said it. It's, it's Gilgamesh. I think I, we said that right as we walked out of the movie and he just had heart. He cared. He, I mean, there was so many things that he, he felt like a fleshed out character other than some of the other cardboard characters. Like, like Thena, I really did not get the hype around Thena, but 
I think that just the what they did with him was just really really sad and i was very disappointed when that happened but so we loved the character we just didn't like the fact that they killed him off at like halfway through the movie exactly yeah. the yeah. one character we liked they killed off halfway through the movie um and this movie had three villains ish i'm still not sure who the bad guy really was so who do y'all think the ultimate villain is in this movie i mean i want to say the celestials I think, or the main celestial, uh, Ersham or whatever. I, I would, my bet would be that he was the main bad guy because he lied to the Eternals. He's been creating them and like wiping them again and telling them the wrong things just so celestials can be born. And he, he lied about the deviants and where they came from and that he created them. Um, and he even, you know, came in at the end and kidnapped some of the Eternals. And so I think ultimately, Ersham is the bad guy, even though he's not super present in the movie as the the villain figure. Um, I I just still don't know. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Uh, you know, you 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 come into this movie because of the trailers and all the the mm-hmm. press of this movie, the marketing of this movie. It's a Marvel movie, and you think Deviants. the deviants are the bad guys throughout mm-hmm. the entire movie. Um, and then they sort of open the movie where they they kind of. To play into that for the first half of the movie. And then you start to find out, okay, maybe it's not them. Maybe it's the Celestials or maybe it's Icarus. It, it, I still yeah, And then it switches know. to Icarus at the end, kind of. I don't know who the main bad guy was supposed to be. And honestly, the Deviants really had no bearing they on had- the modern timeline element of the movie. Nothing. And then you had that super Deviant thing that just showed up in the end. and Ro. Yeah. And, and it had absolutely... No bearing to the story. Nothing. Nothing. Just was there to kill Gilgamesh, and that was it. I I felt like you took him out of the movie, nothing would have changed, and we would still have Gilgamesh, and the movie would probably be a little bit better at that point. Right, and the marketing kind of teased this emergence as having to do with the deviants, and it Mm. really didn't. The the emergence didn't cause the deviants. No. Did it? Did it? No, No. it was... was, No. The deviants just... For somehow got out of the ice that was melted from the emergence. Oh yeah, that's uh, it. Yeah, decades yeah, yeah. from thousands of years, but they'd never explained how we live in a time with amazing technology that can see a lot of things trapped in ice. Well, they don't have satellites pointed everywhere on it the was, Earth. It was Antarctica. Yeah, they're not scanning every square okay. inch. Of, it's of, just it, that that, but that, I that was a little strange. Time. Yes, but Marty, who did you think the, the villain was? I mean. They, I guess it was the Celestials. I, I mean, even though it was made out in the comics and in the trailers that it was the Deviants and then it turned out to be Arishem and then, it, well, it, wait, it turned out to be Icarus. But then Icarus turned good again, but not willingly. I, I don't know, but I'm still not convinced <laughs> that it was the Celestials. I just still have absolutely no idea. But mm-hmm. this did, movie just didn't hit the mark for us, like I've said before. So why do y'all think that it, did, it didn't do well? I think there's a couple of reasons. One, I think that you, uh, we talked about it afterwards um, on the way back. And I love the fact that there are people that really enjoyed this Me movie. Too. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. And I please don't, you know, uh, don't get upset because we have a different opinion on it. Cause we love the fact that you guys love this movie. Your own girlfriend liked this movie. Yeah. Sam. So, um, you know, that's it's great. An, it's an opinion. We're not going to dog on you because you have a different opinion. Than yeah. This. And this we usually just... don't do this. I mean, this is hard for us to have a, a it uh, is. Uh, it's, it's hard for us to talk about a Marvel movie like this. Cause yeah. we love Marvel with it. This one didn't work for a couple of reasons. One, you were introducing way too many characters um, at the same time. And those characters, we have no baseline to go off of. Even if you introduced, let's just say you introduced Captain America, Thor, Spider-Man, Iron Man, the Incredible Hulk, uh, Black Widow, and Hawkeye all at the same time. Mm, that's even Even before we had any of their movies. Mm-hmm. Okay. We still have a little bit of baseline knowledge about every one of those characters. Yeah. We know kind of who they are. We don't with the Eternals. The Eternals are a really obscure fringe comic books uh, line that only went for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And they're Jack Kirby, which is also crazy. Yes. And (laughs) and they've only shown up in a few runs here and there. Exactly. And so so we're getting introduced to to 10 new characters. We're getting introduced to a storyline that spans 7,000 years with it. And we're supposed to try to care 
about everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. That's one reason it didn't work. The second it didn't work is really because you can't tell who you're supposed to be watching the the story through the eyes of. We don't know. Are we looking at it through Cersei? It was maybe Cersei, but but it's not because then they keep jumping around. You have you have um, what was the name? Ajax. Ajax. Yeah, she's. She looks in the trailers like she's some major central figure. She's barely in this movie. Yeah. They moved her, the, you know, the, the moment that we've seen in that ma- that last trailer so much about her on the with ranch seven days and with everything. Icarus and it's going to be seven days and stuff. That feels in the trailer like it's the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. We don't get that till after we find out that she's dead and it's and jarring. It's like really close to the end of the movie. Well, you don't understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. I'm watching this movie and I'm like, did they just cut that scene altogether? Is this the Marvel fake out? Yeah, well, that I scene isn't even that, that movie. They just cut out the scene at this point. For for a long time, I thought they were just faking us out. And so, uh, there's a lot of that that's going on. It just it didn't land. Mm-hmm. They didn't have enough time to develop the characters. They didn't have a time to build out stories that we actually cared about with these characters. And so, all of that together, plus, I, there you know, they mentioned. The DC universe, as much as they mentioned the Marvel universe, yeah, that in the was story. that was going to be my my point. Is it didn't feel like a Marvel movie. There was nothing connecting it to the MCU other than the few references it said, and then with them mentioning mentioning Marvel or, or excuse me DC so much, it could fit in either universe at this point. It feels so disconnected. You don't see anything that's explicitly MCU. You don't see anything that's explicitly DC. It's just its own thing. They mention the blip. They mention. I mean, you Doctor see Strange. Captain America's shield. Okay, you do see Cap's shield in the background of Kingo's plane twice. Yeah, but why? But they, I mean, it's why no different than if a DC comic was in the back. But why is that shield there? Do we even have an answer to that? No. Did they ever mention Maybe why he, he has just that bought shield? one because he felt like it? But it, it it could go in any universe or its own universe at this point there was nothing cementing it in the MCU and that's where it fell flat for me it it didn't connect to the overall story at all and in the end there's nothing it, it didn't do anything for the the MCU the only difference that it made for the overall story is now earth has a giant marble continent on it now made from a dead celestial that's it and then with what happens in the end credits, scene, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, it bridges to something in the future, which makes the end, the final end credit scene, the most important yeah, moment. The second of this end credit movie. scene, I feel like, was the only important moment of that entire. Well, movie. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with the second yeah, one, as much, or the first I, one, as much. I, I mean, oh yeah, yeah. And another disconnection from the Marvel universe. Where were the Avengers throughout all of or this? Or Shield, or Shield, or anything? I mean, Doctor Strange knows about everything in the universe. He is the keeper of time. He is Sorcerer Supreme. Yet he's on like vacation right now or something. Well, maybe he's going, going through on? the multiverse with, with Peter at this point. That, we, that, we again, that, we don't even know don't, the timeline. Exactly. We don't, but it takes place five years after the blip or at least, yeah, five years after the blip. That's what it is. We know that because Ajax said, so it takes place right as everybody came, came back because that's when the emergency okay. was able to happen because they got the population back. But I honestly think that why this movie didn't work. It falls all on the director. I mean, Chloe Zhao should not have directed this movie because it was way too much to put on a rookie in the superhero movie world. This is, she is an amazing director. Do not get me wrong. She won best director, best picture. I've seen some things from Nomadland and they are just absolutely stunning. I have faith in her as a director, but I do not think that she should have done this movie. You're introducing 10 characters that nobody knows that are obviously going to be important in the MCU. And you're putting it all on somebody that has no idea what to do with superheroes. And so I think you get the Russo brothers or John Watts or even, heck, do John Favreau, who introduced the MCU, put him on this movie to start up phase four with these super important characters. You have somebody that knows what they're doing with superheroes, knows what they're doing with Marvel, and you put it on that. And I'm not saying that Chloe Zhao should not have done a superhero movie. Just not this one. I really think that she would do very well with the Marvels. You have an established character with Captain Marvel, and then she could make Miss Marvel her own character and and change that into the mm, film. Yes. I just think that Kevin Feige saw best director 
and was like, we need a lot of people to go see Eternals. And so we'll slap that onto every trailer. And so yeah, it feels like the first like full on swing and a miss. Yes. Since kind yeah. of the dark world. Yeah. So anyway, definitely. Um, so what's up with the post credit scenes? And I'm still not even sure. I've read up some stuff and I am more confused now <laughs> than I was before. So Star Fox, that whole end credit scene where, you know, Three of the Eternals are on the ship. Don't remember what the ship is called. Then you have the weird troll. I think his name was... I forget his name. By Patton Oswalt. Yeah, it was Mm -hmm. Patton Oswalt. Um, Introduces Star Fox or Eros, the brother of the Titan Thanos. From the comics, at least. And and it it makes sense. I mean, the comics, his brother started to actually... Was more Caucasian than Thanos was they didn't really explain why it's just how they started to draw it and then it kind of just took its own form. But, um, <laughs> apparently in the comics, both Thanos and Eros are eternals. Okay. Um, and it is confirmed in this movie, or at least he says he is that he is an eternal. So in, you know, it makes sense that Thanos would also be an eternal. Because okay. he's the brother, right? This, mm-hmm. this, yeah, this that all, does. That seems this logical. All makes sense, except it doesn't. If that's the case, then why didn't Erishim stop Thanos from his genocide so the emergence could begin on Earth? Because that's totally against everything that the Eternals would do. Wow. And how did Erishim not know about this? Was it all part of Erishim's plan? But then why wouldn't he have stopped it? He had to wait five years for the emergence, and then the Eternals found out. So. It, that 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 doesn't it just messes that, up that messes up yeah. everything and so this post credit scene definitely leaves us with more questions than answers but, but it had um, harry styles <laughs> i feel like that's the only reason they put this character in it and then they were like it'll get people to go see the movie they know he's in the movie and uh now that's almost we'll conspiracy be- level there because you're because th- then they have to have the variety guy leak this <laughs> oh no um, <laughs> so- <laughs> and and i'm just saying they're like they're going to see the movie He's in it, and we'll figure it out later. Um, but I'm looking forward to more of this character. I think it's going to be an interesting character to have in the movies. But I'm also looking forward to how they explain this complicated mess of a situation they got themselves in. Now, the second one, Black Knight. This one actually was one of the coolest points of the movie. I think we can all agree with this. Now, this is a character that shows up semi-frequently and is a medieval knight with a sword that gives him power that was made by Merlin, which Merlin wasn't was mentioned in Eternals. Excalibur was specifically yeah, mentioned. Excalibur. The other sword that he was the King yeah. Arthur's sword mm-hmm. and all that. Yeah. yeah, it was weird. That they, they mentioned that. It was kind of and they cool, actually mentioned this. They had the what is it, the name of the sword? The, the Ebony, Blade. Uh, Ebony Blade. Blade. They actually mm-hmm. ask whether or not she uh, Athena is wielding the Ebony exactly. Blade. And she's like, No, it's Excalibur. Yeah. Just offhandedly. Yeah. Which the whole Black Knight stuff is really cool, but I don't think that was the biggest thing to come out of this scene, honestly. I mean, we hear a voice stopping Dane from touching the blade, and we find out that it's none other than Blade himself, or at least Chloe Zhao says it is. So that's at the Blade in the Marvel Universe. All right, I've we- got a question, and this is going to sound like I'm a complete... Um, um you know, rookie when it comes to to Marvel stuff, but I'm an MCU guy, not a Marvel comics mm-hmm. guy, and I haven't watched the Blade movies. So I why mean, is Blade called Blade? I don't know. Does it have something to do? Well, with Well, he like, uses a blade all the time. He does. Okay. He like wields a katana. And I just stuff. didn't know if it had something to do with the Ebony Blade or. Anything do you think like that, that they're going to be like introducing Blade from Morbius because he's a vampire hunter? Ooh, that would be cool. That'd be that might be a way to introduce him to the MCU, yeah. anyway. but. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure. This movie was kind of a miss, but I'm really happy that some people enjoyed this movie. That is amazing. And I'm just... Yeah, I'm I, I, I want to stop, though, and, and kind of address something that we didn't address um, on here. Um, and let's have our dad moment for this week. I am your father. Uh, let's talk about the reason for the sexual content rating in this film. Um we knew it was coming. We'd read uh, what it was and when it would happen, we were basically prepared for what we got uh, mm-hmm. from it. But the moment that the scene began, someone in the row behind us uh, spoke loudly mm-hmm. uh, said in a Marvel movie. And now this isn't two weekends uh, into the film's release. This guy wasn't some low level Marvel viewer that was going, you know, mm-hmm. a few weeks down the road. He was attending the Thursday premiere of the film in IMAX. And he said what I'm sure lots of people uh, have said when they saw this scene. And here's the biggest issue um, that I have with it. It's 
a scene that has no purpose in this movie. It didn't change the story in any way. Uh, nothing came out as a result of it. It was pointless. The only reason to have this in the scene in this movie was um, what, and it was admittedly very mild um, sexual scene. But the only reason to have it was to say that they had one uh, in it, and that's really for me the most disappointing part of this. Uh, moment and really kind of the whole film. Imagine a seven year old kid who's excited to go see a Marvel movie. And um, over the history of the MCU outside of Iron Man and the Incredible Hulk, um, which were not Disney related mm, movies, right. they were paramount at that time. Um, families have been able to attend these films with having, without having this issue of sexual content to be concerned about and not anymore. Um, and I'm, just, I really only honestly have one thing to say, uh, to this. And I know you guys, I mean, there's nobody listening to this that's gonna care, gonna, gonna fit this mold, but I, I wanna say it. Marvel and Disney do better. Mm-hmm. No reason to have this in this film. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm very excited and interested to see where they go with these characters. I think that if they can, you know, bring them back in and hopefully save them in the eyes of every, all the Marvel fans, it would be great, but I'm not sure how they're going to do that. Yeah. Good job, BB Nate. Thanks Thank for you, navigating Nate. a very complicated conversation yeah, no problem. Uh, for us. Um, uh, there's a, a new movie that, that is just bombing at the box office. Really? Yeah. Really? Um, and then um, Adam Warlock, um, the actor, uh, he's mm-hmm. he's fearing for his family's safety because he was cast in the MCU, and you know the more things change, the more things stay the same. We got more information about the Black Widow being replaced. Oh, interesting! In the MCU, that'll be all up next on Bad News. This is not going to go the way you think. All right, it's our new "What did we you uh, wear to church yesterday?" segment. <laughs> That's new. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, the three of us are sharp dressed fans, um, and we dress up to go to church. So, uh, did you guys any- wear anything from Cufflinks.com on Sunday? Yeah, I wore uh, some Mythosaur socks. Uh, wait, no, that wasn't this week. They weren't clean. I wore them for Jets uh, play. But um, oh, you wore that for, for I wore that for Susical Junior. Susical Junior. Okay. Yeah, I gotta gotta have the good socks on. But I wore. My Mythosaur tie and my uh, hyperspace tie bar, but awesome. I'm planning on wearing my uh, my other Mandalorian tie with some red in it sometime. All right, awesome. BB Nate, what did you wear yesterday? I wore the Batman tie, the Batman tie bar, and Batman socks. Actually, I was, I was so it was a Batman day for it you. Was, it, was, it was this your reaction to, uh, it, to I, Eternals? I was I was <laughs> fighting it um, yeah. all weekend. I wore a Batman shirt to Eternals and yeah. everything. I was planning on wearing my my Turbis the Porg uh, cufflinks. I don't think they actually call it, they don't they don't actually call them no, Turbis the they Porg. They should. Don't. Because he is canon. Yes. Um, and we're going to have to lobby for that. But anyway, we, I, my poor cufflinks, I was going to wear those on Sunday. But I don't have a white cu- uh, French cuff shirt that fit. Um, oh. It was your shirt. And so it didn't fit. And I would have been <laughs> uncomfortable um, with it. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, here's the thing, though, that we love about this. It's not just, you know, you heard it just now. You know, It was socks. It's tie bars. It's cufflinks. It's ties. It's you know, all of these different things that they, that they offer over at cufflinks.com. And it's super fun to be able to wear these things because you can wear them, um, and celebrate your fandom, but it's not like a a flashing neon sign that says I'm a super nerd, um, (laughs) with it, but you can all, you know, but here's, what's fun is people notice them though. Mm -hmm. If they're nerds like us Mm -hmm. and they see your socks or they see your tie and they're like, Oh, like you better believe I'm wearing my, uh, my star Wars tie to this like resume workshop I have on Friday. Like I'm oh, totally, yeah. I'm totally wearing it because it's it's still dressy and classy, but you know, got to show off. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty awesome stuff. I love that. And yeah. they have over three thousand items on the website covering not just cufflinks, but like we said, ties, tie bars, socks, money clips, and other great gifts from all fandoms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I need to get y'all's attention though. It okay. is time to start your Christmas shopping. It is November uh, the 8th, 9th. At 9th at the time of release, eighth right now. Okay, it is getting really close to Christmas. So, use the code Tatooine15 at the checkout to receive 15% off everything on the site with no minimum order required. I promise you, if you have a nerd in your in your life and they like to dress up, you will find something for them on yeah. this website. It's awesome. Head on over to cufflinks.com today and like Samuel Hutt just said, remember to use the code Tatooine15 at checkout. Well, you want the bad news or the really bad news? All right, headline one 
Red Notice set to earn less than one million dollars at the box Oof, office. That's bad. Yeah, um, you aren't alone if you haven't ever even heard of the Netflix original <laughs> film um, that's going to, going to be released in the next weekend. Uh, Red Notice stars uh, Dwayne Johnson, Ryan Reynolds, and Gal Gadot. So you've big got, names. You've got Black Adam, um, Green Deadpool. Lantern. <laughs> and Wonder Woman. Uh, hey, they're all, those are DC, but yeah, uh, it was released uh, on several. It's going to be released on several hundred screens um, coming up this weekend, and uh, um, as well as on the Netflix streaming platform. The big difference about this scenario from other simultaneous releases like Black Widow and Wonder Woman 1984 is that Netflix isn't releasing this film in theaters to get box office ticket sales. They haven't even marketed it for the theaters at all. It's being released in order to qualify for award nominations. Um, And Netflix hasn't marketed it for trying to get box office sales. Um, The film will, when it's released, it's going to inevitably sit atop the Netflix list of trending movies uh, for weeks after its release. It's getting great reviews. Mm -hmm. Um, This headline from We Got This Covered is true. It's set to earn less than a million dollars at the box office, but it's highly misleading. That's really only true from a certain point of view. So I'm going to give it a clickbait level five. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. Uh, Um, Will Poulter. Fears yeah. for his family's safety because of MCU casting. That sounds terrifying. Um, we haven't talked about it on the show yet, but it was announced about a month ago that Will Poulter is going to be playing Adam Warlock in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, this deadline is way blown out of proportion. Poulter's comments were in jest. He was appearing on the Jonathan Ross show and discussing the level of secrecy regarding his role in the MCU. Poulter said, because it's Marvel, I'm kind of sworn to secrecy and i'm actually terrified for the safety of my family lest i say something so you have nothing to worry about (laughs) will and his family aren't in any mortal danger definitely a clickbait level eight (laughs) all right all right and marvel's recast black widow actress reportedly starring in next year's big sequel (gasps) this again (laughs) yeah this headline from inside the magic is a master class in clickbait strategy if you don't have anything new to report change up a previously used click and the headline and repost the same story all over again. Several weeks ago, we talked about how a headline suggesting that Scarlett Johansson was being replaced in the MCU. This sounds like something dramatic regarding Black Widow and future films. Which doesn't make sense because she's dead. (laughs) This is exactly what today's headline is also suggesting. And just like in the previous article from weeks ago, the real story has nothing to do with the MCU films. It's about the voiceover actor from What If Season 1 reprising her role as Natasha Romanoff in Season 2 of the series. The article even lists side-by-side photos of the voiceover actress and Johansson. Yeah, and (laughs) is specifically looking like she's trying to look like Black Widow. Oh my gosh. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Sometimes these websites don't ever try. (laughs) Um, This is a clickbait level of 10. Yeah. Ouch. It's a big one. Mm Mm-hmm. Shmooly. That's my name. It's your turn. Yes, sir. Uh, as a surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one to many Star Wars fans. Uh, last week, the trailer for Book of Boba Fett was released. It promises to not be Mandalorian Season 3 and looks to be giving <laughs> Boba fans everything they could ever want and more, as well as giving us a deeper look into the character. We'll break that down next. Be on your guard. There are older and fouler things than orcs in the deep places of the world. All right, then. Keep your secrets. You're coming to us. He's as the footsteps of steps and steps. There are many magic rings in this world, Bilbo Baggins, and none of them should be used lightly. That little spider thing was at the beginning. I guess. Yeah, wasn't that from Return of the Jedi? It was in Return, Return of the Jedi. Jedi. So basically, I don't remember the fancy name. They're called monks or something, something monks, right? And what they are basically these monks who had their brains removed from their bodies and put in robots because they wanted to avoid all sensual physical desires. That's crazy stuff. So they, um, oh right, <laughs> <laughs> that's what the little spider guy is. It's a, did it's not, a, did a not, monk's brain. I did not know that. Well, now you do. Yeah. Um, figured I'd drop that art for you. All right. Thanks. Before we go any further, <laughs> yeah, just a little nightmare feel for you. I just I, if you if you know what I just referenced when I said that, I did uh, I, I did not, not know that. that. Tweet us if you're listening. To I this. feel like I should know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we'll I talk know about it off the okay. show. So. Um, 
Rating on a scale of one to ten helmets full of credits. Oh wow! Of, yeah, that's good. Of the uh, of the trailer of the trailer. Yeah. Um, the scale, uh, to the trailer. Um, sh- you want me to be honest? Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna give it a six. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. I know that's harsh, but this trailer gave me nothing. That's fair. It relied on the hype of Boba Fett, and I'm personally not a Boba Fett guy. I wanted something more about what could draw me into the, the story or something that's i fair. wanted something that i was like yeah. okay i'm not a boba fett fan but why should i watch this series that's yeah. a good point I, I'm, I'm going five or that. six on it and i'm okay. thinking the same thing just it, it's not like it was a bad no not at story all. or i'm not looking forward to the the, sh- mm-hmm. the 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 series i just don't think the trailer did much at all to get uh, a story across it was just kind of like hey guys here's a boba fett trailer mm-hmm. and they showed some fun scenes and i read a little bit which kind of made me a little more excited about it once i studied it but overall it, you know, I'm still going to watch it. I didn't need that trailer to do that. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Good thing because it didn't work. Out, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was I was going to give it a seven or so. Um, y'all make a good point. It it didn't do much trailer wise. Uh, it didn't give you anything. It was a teaser trailer, but even for teaser trailers, it didn't give us much. It was mm-hmm. a hype trailer basically to you know to to capitalize on the fact that Boba is back. Um, but I'm so excited nonetheless. But let's let's talk about some some little points that uh, we can glean from this trailer um they made sure to stop any thoughts that this would be another bounty hunter story right that's been the theme with bad batch and mandalorian where they bounce from job to job and and, and gig to gig right but boba's first line in this trailer is i'm not a bounty hunter right that's that's how they start this trailer off so from the trailer i know nate you said that they didn't Mm -hmm. give us much to go off of but from the trailer what do you guys think is going to be the plot of this show. I mean, it looks like Dad really has something Go he down. wants to say. Go ahead. He's rebuilding the crime syndicate from the Clone Wars that he. Oh, about. okay. Like, I think that he's like trying All to right. go in there and put together like gather in the remnants of Crimson Dawn and mm. he's trying to like unify the the crime families um, that's why he's he he's meeting with the Athorian and all of these other people the the Transdo- Trandoshans mm-hmm. and all that mm-hmm. he's trying to unify all of these fractured crime groups crime, uh, families after Return of the Jedi, after the death of Jabba the Hutt, he's going back to Jabba's throne. He's reuniting them. He's been on Tatooine. He knows what's going on. He's been behind the scenes. Now he's coming out, and he's going to make something amazing happen with that. Hmm. Nate, what do you think? I think it's just going to be him kind of tidying up some of Jabba's loose ends and starting his own little crime empire. So, yeah, I, I would. I, it would make sense for him to start the crime city again because he was so in tune with that in the early years of the prequels. I'm telling you, so. they're building up Crimson Dawn in the comic books and in the other they stuff are. really big right now. I could totally see Crimson You just want Dawn. Solo too. I do want Solo <laughs> too. But I think Crimson Dawn is, is a part of this. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think we all do. You know, I was kind of with Nathan, I think, at first. Um, just him going to be kind of rebuilding the little thing on, on Tatooine, kind of getting that uh, business, if you will, uh, up and running again. But now that you've mentioned that, Dad, your perspective, I hope that that's the case. I hope he's not only rebuilding um, Jabba's uh, crime family or whatever, but also trying to reunite things again, because I think that would be a really interesting thing to happen. I mean, the Empire's gone, so there's not as much control over the crime syndicates at this point. What better time to restart the criminal underworld? And and that's a storyline we haven't really explored much in this it's been really limited right so i think i think that's an interesting point and who better to lead and if we're going by the title the book of boba fett sounds like something that's kind of telling the legend of an amazing saga uh, a crime lord is what it could be Hmm. so that's an interesting point yeah um so boba says he intends to rule with respect rather than fear as jabba did um it seems like he wants to do things a little bit differently than his old boss but then in the end, he threatens to kill them the same way Jabba would. So that seems a bit contradictory. Well, it doesn't seem like he does, though. He kind of acts like, you know, this is the way Jabba would do it. Go ahead, you know, and, and say what you need to say. And so I didn't gather that that's what he was doing. But it seemed like there was a bit of edge on, on his know. words there. It, it seems like, I don't think this is going to be a kind of a good guy. I think he's going to be... Um, respecting crime again. I think like what dad said, the crime syndicate. I mean, you had Dryden Voss who was ruthless. It, he definitely used fear, but he was always respectful in deals. And if you made a deal and honored it, well, he, he relied would- a lot on fear though in Solo. 
in I mean, some he, aspects, yes. Yeah, he he re- relied on fear if you failed, but he gave you know Tobias Beckett That's that fair. extra shot. That's he did, um, which because he knew about how loyal he actually was. Because Tobias Beckett and by extension Crimson Dawn understood that profit is more important than killing off somebody. Mm -hmm. And so they had the opportunity to get the coaxium. And I hope that that's kind of what's going to happen with Boba Fett and Crimson Dawn. If that, because I do think it's going to be Crimson Dawn, but anyway, Mm -hmm. so Boba will be not a good guy. He's a good guy. He's He's more of an anti-hero. He's going to be, I don't even know if you would call him an anti-hero, just kind of not the Godfather. Okay. Just, 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 he's going to make him an offer. A bad guy, but not like a Loki bad guy. Yeah, Loki bad guy. Almost. Okay. Almost, and I think yeah. that would be good to kind of respect his his character from the original yeah. trilogy and I stuff. I think that people always forget that he is a bad guy. Yeah. First off. So. Yeah. Um so we we can see from the trailer that Boba's armor isn't as pristine as we last saw mm-hmm. in The Mandalorian, suggesting some time has passed since we last saw him. How much later could this be taking place, and what effects could that have on the overall story of Star Wars? <laughs> it's hard to know. I, I'm trying to remember the the post credit scene in Mandalorian season two when he goes to Jabba's throne with Fennec mm-hmm. Shand. Is his armor still pristine in that scene? I believe it is. Yeah. Okay. It looks so like this it's is taking the place. End of Mandalorian, the series yeah. is taking place somewhat distant from that, at least mm-hmm. long enough for him to have gotten into a few scuffles or something right. like that. Um, with it, was the dent in the helmet at? Yes, he's oh, always had. He's the always den. had the den. Mm-hmm. Okay, I was just curious because I saw it in the in the trailer. Um, yeah, I, I I think it's cool. Maybe we're gonna it's gonna pick up and we're gonna have things a little bit more in chaos um, than just sort of picking up from the the end credit scene. I think it'd be cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I th- um, I'm not sure. I don't think it'll be taking place too long. Maybe a few months, six months. Maybe okay. is a, it's a good good median to go. I think that with him being so active and trying to do whatever he is doing, he's bound to get in a good amount of fights. Mm-hmm. So I think that it just makes sense for his armor to get scuffed up again. So, mm-hmm. um, so let's have a little fun and, uh, and go with some, some speculations sure to go wrong. Okay. We, we, we like those occasionally. Awesome. So, um, who do you guys, if, if y'all speculated like crazy, who would you want to show up in this series? I think this is this isn't even that crazy. I have something to back this up. I think Ahsoka is a good possibility. Really? I think that if you're reinstating the crime syndicate, she obviously knows about it. I mean, with season seven and everything. So I think that we could see her trying to get information from Boba since he's so in tuned with the galaxy and the underworld and the underworld Hmm. and everything like that. It's about where Thrawn's whereabouts are because she went to Moff Gideon. She went to this person that went to, that was worked under Moff Gideon for information. So why not go to Boba who knows more? So, and and that kind of cements more of the idea of the Mandoverse, how each of these series kind of connect to each other. That's a good point. You said this is speculation sure to go wrong. Yes. Go for it. Go for it. Wherever you want to see. I'm going after, uh, Kira. Kira. Yeah, really. I think Kira is be- Kira has been set up in the comics. She'd have mm-hmm. to be a lot older. Kira has been se- no, no. This is yeah. guys. This is five, six years after Return of exactly. the Jedi. She's she, 10, she would have to be she's like, like ten, 10 years, years older. Old, twenty years from twenty years from Solo is okay. what we're talking. That's not crazy. Not crazy at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, with this, you bring in Kira. She has been the leader of the Crimson Dawn. If this becomes about him trying to regather Crimson Dawn, then inevitably, if she's still alive, which the comics seem to suggest she's going to survive. In fact, in the comics, there's the first meeting of between uh, Leia and Kira, by the way. Huh. Really? They've had that in the comics. Oh, that's yeah. awkward. <laughs> um, exactly. Um, do you, BB, a little side note. Do you guys remember when we saw Solo yes. and BB Nate's, mm-hmm. like one of his biggest frustrations from that entire movie? Oh, yeah. Was that Han Solo had been in love with somebody other than Leia? <laughs> other than Leia before. You were yeah. such a little I was, kid. I was, I was so angry. I remember that. <laughs> I love that. Uh, anyway, yeah, I think it's going to be Crimson Dawn that's part of this. Okay. And I think it's going to be Kira that she's going to show up. And that's going to be the big surprise cameo in season. In this yeah, season. I like it. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I I had been thinking because it's been a day. I haven't put a whole lot of thought into it, but I was thinking, ooh, wouldn't it be neat if we saw Maul? And then as we were talking about <laughs> it, I was realizing, wait, Maul's dead. <laughs> yeah, the Twin Suns has happened at this point. Um, so my next thought would, I would hope to see, and this is really going to definitely go wrong, but I want to see Thrawn, um, kind of along the lines of what you've been saying, Nate. Maybe as they've been digging up the underworld. 
Thrawn's been hiding in the underworld at this point. We, we don't know what he's been up, been up to. Eventually, uh, Boba stumbles across something, and Thrawn shows up. Maybe he's been start, starting his own little his own little faction, and um, they end up button heads. Maybe he's like the new villain or something. Because we don't even have really a villain for this series. I think, yeah. that, if, I think that if Kira does show up, I think that should be the villain. Okay. Wouldn't oppose, that be, wouldn't opposing that Boba be Fett for starting yeah. up the Crimson Dawn again because of how much the Crimson Dawn screwed up her life. That would be that well, no. Would, she no, guys. I don't think you understand. She's, she's the head it. of Crimson Dawn oh, in the comics. It didn't screw up her life. She's on top. Yeah, <laughs> she wants it back. Mm-hmm. I think that that's that, the that story, would that would be good. Which would be a really fun twist to make Boba Fett sort of your hero. Yeah. in this, and then Kira, your villain. Mm-hmm. Oh, that would be cool. But they're both still like you know, Boba's still using criminals <laughs> to be the good guy. I think that would be a fun yeah, storyline. It would be super. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, the book of Boba Fett is set to premiere next month on uh, December 29th on Disney Plus. If you're a fan of The Mandalorian or just a Boba Fett fan like me, it promises to be a lot of fun. And uh, like we say, any new Star Wars is good Star Wars. Yeah, that's right. So. Awesome. Um, there's some stuff happening in movies uh, coming up. We've got a big red dog showing up and we're going to go to Ireland and we've got a couple trailers and we should probably talk about all that. So that's up next on Movie Moments. At last, we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last, we will have revenge. A couple new movie releases this week. We got Clifford the Big Red Dog. The Big, the bid red, the the big bid. red Dog. <laughs> Yo, it's the Big Red Dog. It, well, it's, you know it's what I'm set saying. in New York, so I have to say it like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the log line, or this seems like a whole is it really? novel. Um, yeah, it is set in New York. Uh, okay. They go They go to the... <laughs> they oh, there it is. Yeah, the, I see it. Um, yeah. This is a whole paragraph. Um, as middle schooler, Emmy, Emily Elizabeth struggles to fit in at home and at school. She discovers a small red puppy who was destined to become her best friend from a magical animal rescuer. Wow, this sounds like an acid trip. <laughs> um, I, I didn't watch Clifford as a kid. Okay. I, I didn't. Um, when Clifford becomes a gigantic red dog in her New York City apartment and attracts the attention of genetics company who wish to supersize animals, Emily and her clueless uncle Casey have to fight the forces of greed as they go on the run across New York City and take a bite out of the Big Apple. Along the way, Clifford affects the lives of everyone around him and teaches Emily and her uncle the true meaning of acceptance and unconditional love. Based on the beloved school ta- scholastic, scholastic character, <laughs> Clifford will teach the world how to love big. All right. Wow. All right. That is a kid's movie. And guess what, through. Sam? Your girlfriend wants to see this movie, which means you have to go. I'll figure it out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sammy. I apologize. The stars are Darby Camp, Jack Whitehall, and Isaac Wang. All right. right. Studios Paramount. So, hey, you could just get away with watching it on Paramount Plus. And the directors (laughs) are, is Walt Becker. Okay. It's rated uh, PG. It's rated PG for impolite humor, (laughs) uh, thematic elements, and mild action. So, when is humor polite? I don't know. The All best right. kind of humor is generally impolite. All right. All <laughs> right. The next one, Belfast, which actually sounds more interesting than Clifford. Um, the long line. A young boy and his working class family experienced the tumultuous late 1960s. Okay, that We've seen gave the me trailer nothing. for this. It's not that interesting. It, 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 <laughs> I have no idea what this movie is about, but for some reason I would see this over Clifford. Um, okay. because, just because of the, the main actor who looks a lot like dad. Right? Oh, no, that's no, Jude Law. Jude that's Law. Jude Law. The stars are Jude Hill, <laughs> Louis McCaskey. Mac- McCaskey. You can't read these things? And, oh, wow. It's really not that Catriona complicated. Catriona There Balfe. you go. Good Alrighty. job. That's interesting. The studio's focus features and the director is Kenneth Braun. Braunog. Braunog? Yeah. He, he, he directed Braun. Thor. Did you know that? Yeah, I know. He, yeah, I knew he directed I Thor. It's rated PG-13 for some violence and strong language. Yeah. Now for trailers, we had the Ghostbusters Afterlife uh, final trailer. It was a minute oh, I long. Seen that one. Um, uh, I sent it to you in Messenger the I, or today. It looks really good, and it looks like it we was might a be great having... trailer. It's the first time you get to actually see the first the, glimpse the of the actual yeah. Ghostbusters. Yeah, it looks like yeah. we might be having an end game moment for for Ghostbusters, which yeah. is going to be pretty interesting. And then we had the Sing Two like almost three and a half minute long trailer that what gave away of... every plot point in the movie. Everything. Really? The whole like first minute was like one of the final scenes from the end of the movie. Okay, so I watched the trailer and all I came across was these are all the like these are all singing moments in this movie. That's all that it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
It, that was also it. But we had, I mean, it just, there were so many plot, big plot points that really? happened okay. that they revealed. Okay. They did the same thing with the first trailer, too. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm excited for Ghostbusters. I'm not quite sure about Sing 2. Um, and the box office numbers for this week, Eternals came away with a 71 million opening weekend. Okay, where did they project it? 75 million okay. at minimum. So, so it's basically it, on, it's on target. It's, 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 it's a little bit on target, yeah. Dune came away with 7.7 7 million and 84 million accumulative. Um, and No Time to Die still came away with a strong six million, which hey, is actually pretty really good, good with 143 million accumulative. The, the thing about Eternals is not the opening weekend; it's going to be the second. It's going to be the second weekend. Yeah, everybody goes weekend. to the Marvel movies. It's going to yeah. be the weekend with Ghostbusters. It's going to drop off the radar. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. All right. Um, well, it's not every week that we get to include an interview with someone who has made as great an impact on Star Wars fandom as the guests we interviewed this past weekend for Potathon uh, 2021. And we just really couldn't pass up the opportunity to play that interview uh, for you here again on the podcast today. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. Rebellions are built on hope. Force is with me, and I am with the Force. If you live long enough, you see the same eyes in different people. So that was um, a completely unexpected um, success. Uh, this weekend for Potathon 2021. Uh, that was awesome. It was pretty, pretty amazing. If you guys didn't get a chance to listen in on um, uh, on the Potathon, you missed out on uh, like 16 hours of so, amazing yeah. Star Wars conversation and interviews and guests. Um, it was on um, YouTube uh, streaming all day long. It was really an amazing day. We had, uh, you know, some of the best Star Wars podcasters, YouTubers, Alex and, and Molly Damon, Ken Knapsack and Joseph Scrimshaw, of course. Pete Fletcher from Around the Galaxy, Scotty J. Rowe from uh, the Bombad cast, and a, and a, just a Tarkin's top shelf, a bunch of them. Just they just kept going over and over again, and somehow we got a li- we got to be a part of it, um, which is yeah. awesome. And- <laughs> And absolutely um, humbling and honoring uh, mm-hmm. to be able to have been a part of it. The best part about it was not what happened with you know the content on mm-hmm. there although that was stuff was pretty awesome it was the amazing fans that were watching and participating in the potathon because uh it was a fundraiser for make a wish foundation and the goal coming into the weekend or when the planning began i'll start with that the goal when the planning began for this was two thousand mm-hmm. dollars to be raised um and uh they opened up donations a couple weeks in advance and we ended up seeing over three thousand dollars raised by the time that the potathon began saturday morning so then the numbers started creeping up. You know, you feel like everybody already gave at that point, mm-hmm. like that, you know, everybody that was going to participate had already participated. Mm-hmm. And so you're just kind of hoping you can get it up to 4,000 maybe. And then all of a sudden we're going after 5,000. And before it was all over, they raised $8,260 uh, for Make-A-Wish Foundation. That's and that just is the it's most amazing. beautiful thing about uh, this weekend was seeing how Star Wars fans can come together and do something like that. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, for us, our little part of this was an amazing interview um, with a um, gentleman that uh, you're na- you may not fami- be familiar with by name, um, but Scott Trowbridge is someone that you are definitely familiar uh, with his work. He's um, an um, uh, an American entertainment uh, creator. He's currently serving as the portfolio creative executive uh, for Walt Disney Imagineering, and uh, he heads the design and production division. Uh, for Disney parks and experiences and products, which is obviously a division of Walt Disney. Um, So let me translate what I just said there. Basically, (laughs) uh, Scott is helping Disney and Star Wars create the Galaxy's Edge and the new Galactic Star Cruiser that's opening next March. And Scott joined us um, last week uh, for Potathon 2021 for just a few minutes to discuss Star Wars and those immersive experiences. Here's what he had to say. Good to see you. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes with us. We'll try to to make this as quick and painless on you as possible because we know how busy you are. Um, We are busy making the Star Wars and all the other cool things around the world. Absolutely. (laughs) We're super excited about this. And especially because of everything that we're doing with Potathon 2021 and how it's a a fundraiser for Make-A-Wish. It's an extra special thing to have you on here for that. So thank you for it. We're going to jump right in if that's cool. Yes, let's do. All right. Awesome. Um, all right. We're going to uh, 
we to, to give you some context, Scott, um, we are mega super Star Wars fans. Um, and we lived in Orlando for about a year and probably went to Galaxy's Edge 30 times uh, while we were down there. We had annual passes and went constantly. Um, and we were so totally uh, taken back by how just immersive in, in, in the entire park is. And then when I think about the making of Galaxy's Edge and Batu and everything, my question is, was there ever a moment when you were in that development stage and something came to, to the table to, to discuss, to make or to develop? And you thought, how is this even going to be possible? Oh yeah. I mean, almost everything, um, <laughs> you know, we're always, we're, we're always, as we, as we think about these, these projects, we're always kind of looking just over the horizon to what's almost possible, right. As we're thinking about the new techniques and technologies and all the things we want to bring to, to life in these, in these experiences. So, you know, for, for Galaxy Z, it was everything from the, you know, how are we going to pull off a big epic ride experience like Rise of the Resistance all the way to how are we going to create uh, like um, real time gaming technology that is kind of at the heart of the Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run experience. I mean, that's a that's an example of when we started the project, that technology didn't exist. We right. we started that project kind of with the hope and faith and trust that along the way we would be able to develop that technology, partner with others who are developing the technology, but that by the time we needed it, that high end real time kind of gaming engine would exist and be available for us to use. But, you know, we're, I mean, there were, there are definitely days along those journeys where you're kind of like, Oh, I, you know, I hope this is going to work out the way we think it does. And like, I hope this thing's, you know, we're kind of leaving, we're kind of jumping off the cliff in the hopes that the mattress is going to show up when we need it to show up. <laughs> that's awesome. Now you guys are in the process of uh, finalizing something else. That's going to be completely immersive down there, which is this galactic star cruiser. It's set to open next March. Uh, how is this, um, property and resort experience going to take immersion in star Wars to a whole new level. So in, I think it's going it, to, it's in a, we're going to break some ground in a couple of new ways. The, the first is this is the first time you're going to be able to spend such an extended time in any single story, right? Instead of where, whereas galaxy's edge is a great way to invite you to step into the world of star Wars and spend a couple of hours there. We're, we're inviting you to spend a couple of days immersed in a, in a, in your star Wars story where you're truly a character uh, right alongside the other, other characters that are part of it. Some of the characters, some of them are characters you, you've known for a long time. Some you're meeting for the first time, but you're right alongside those folks living out a star Wars story. That is truly a result of who you want to be in the galaxy and the choices you make in the galaxy. I think that's a new idea. Um, uh, both for the level of immersion and also the level of agency that you kind of get to bring to that experience, to the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser experience. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and you've designed some of the most awarded ride experiences in the world, including the amazing adventures of Spider-Man and Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. Just like Galaxy's Edge and the Galactic Star Cruiser, these rides are known for immersing the guests into the story they're telling. What makes a ride immersive and why is it something that you are so committed to doing? Um, well, I'll give you two reasons why I'm committed to doing it. One, those are the things I love, right? Those are the things I want to do. I want to, I want to go into experiences and have these experiences that I can't believe are really happening and right. And they probably aren't really happening, but I can fully believe that they are, uh, right alongside, you know, these characters that I know and love and stepping into these story worlds. So, so part of it is because, because those are the things that I love to do. And I'm just such a big fan when, uh, of any experience that's a, that, that um, transports our guests or transports an audience into a new, a new reality. I love that. I love doing it. And I, I just want to help create those experiences and help teams that are creating those experiences for everybody else. Because, I mean, selfishly, I love them. Less <laughs> selfishly, I think everyone else loves them too, or at least a lot of people do. So yeah, they absolutely do. When you, you spend so much time working on these projects and, and these, these experiences, do you, when you go back through and you finally get to experience them for yourselves and ride the ride again, how is that experience? Are you just sitting there thinking like, oh, I could have done that a little bit better? Or is it still <laughs> just as fun as if you were a guest coming to the park for the first time? Um, it is. It, it, this is going to be a weird answer, but I love watching the people. Not okay. the experience. 
I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, we're doing all of this work for audiences, right? We're doing it for fans. We're doing it for our guests. We want them to have a great time. They are the reason. You are the reason that we do these things. So when we get the opportunity, I'll just speak for myself. When I get the opportunity to go in and you know revisit something, I'm always watching the people. I'm not really usually watching the thing um, mm-hmm. because I know the thing. I know the thing like the back of my hand. I don't, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't. There's no surprises in the th- right. in the in the experience for me because I know it like the back of the hand. I could probably you know recite the whole thing by heart by the, by that <laughs> point. But yeah. watching the people who are experiencing it and just hoping that they're having a good time and paying attention to what they're paying attention to, that's the that's the interesting part for me. Oh yeah, that's it. Reminds me of the last few times we uh, got to ride Rise of the Resistance. How we'd been on it, you know, a dozen plus times at that point, and we were getting on the uh, the the uh, transport at the beginning and we're with other people and you can tell this is their first time. (laughs) And then you realize, wait, they should probably move to this spot and see this. And they, you know, we're moving them around on the oh, thing. So go, awesome. go stand over here. You know, this is a better spot. We'll trade spots with you and that kind of stuff. So <laughs> that's I totally so understand awesome. what you're saying on that. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of fun to see those things through fresh eyes too, right? If you've, you know, oh, it's, absolutely. It's, it's, it's especially one, little kids, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, that is, that is what I love the most about, about creating these things is, you know, and when we, you know, you said like when we finish one of these things, you know, what's that like? Um, you know, when we open something, I'm almost always going to be lurking around the exit, just watching people <laughs> like hiding behind a bush or a tree, just like, you know, trying to watch people and kind of go like, what are the, what's the, what's the reaction? What's the look on the face, right? What are they talking about? Are they talking about the, this thing that happened or this other thing that happened, or are they talking about nothing? Um, you know, that's, that is, that is ultimately the payoff is being able to kind of experience it all through the, through the eyes and through the lens of our, of the, of our audiences. They're, you know, mm-hmm. they're the reason we do this. That's so cool. That's cool. Yeah. We, um, we watched the Imagineering story like twice before we moved <laughs> to Orlando, I think. Um, and it was really fascinating to me uh, because I'm studying to become a mechanical engineer right now. It's what I'm in college for. Um, so it really spoke to me, but you're a part of an amazing legacy of Disney Imagineers. What does it really mean to you to be an Imagineer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it is really being a part of a legacy that goes all the way back to Walt Disney. You know, when you think about Walt Disney Imagineering or originally WED Enterprises, you know, right. I mean, it was Walt's private think tank, right? It was kind of, kind of even lived outside of the the movie studio and everything else. It was kind of his his little private skunk works and think tank, um, and and a great place for innovation to happen. You can when you think about all the even in those early days, you know that Walt Disney himself was such an innovator. Whether it was thinking about new ways to make animated films or you know, what, what eventually became audio animatronics and bringing characters to life kind of in, you know, in mechanical ways or in the whole idea of an immersive theme park, there was such innovation that happened there. And then that legacy of innovation continued and continues to this day through Imagineering. You both feel the, the kind of the weight of, of that, of, of expectation and, um, oh, we have to get this right. You kind of feel those obligations and duties, for sure. But also what amazing opportunities, what amazing potential, like what are we going to do next? Right. The, 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 so many Imagineers are focused on, wouldn't it be cool if, and what are we going to do next? And how can we make this real? And we have such amazing talent, whether it's artistic talent, technical talent, engineering talent, um, fabrication and construction talent, all that, you know, that are all focused on the, that same goal of how do we bring dreams to life or make it seem like we're bringing dreams to life. And how do we make, you know, how do we make magic real? Um, I mean, you're in school for engineering, you know, a lot about how this works. You know that, I mean, a lot of times we use, you may, you may be familiar with that Arthur C. Clarke quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Mm -hmm. That's how we spend a lot of of our day (laughs) thinking about how can we use or, misuse or <laughs> use in unexpected ways, you know, the, the technology of today or tomorrow mm-hmm. to help that be a proxy for the surprising, the unexpected, the magical. Um, yeah. And we have just an amazing group of people that that's what they think about all day, every day. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's mind boggling to think about how different the world would be 
if there wasn't the uh, the Imagineering uh, team mm-hmm. uh, down there and the things that they've they've developed in in history, it's it's stunning. Um, we ask this, we love to ask this question for everybody that we talk to that's got any connection to Star Wars. Um, for you, how does Star Wars inspire hope? Mm. I one of the things I love about Star Wars is the core story that I for me you know is is there are many core stories, but it's the one that I think resonates the most which is that idea that anyone can make a difference. Whether you're a, you know, a poor moisture farmer on the outreaches of Tatooine or whether you're a parentless scavenger girl stuck on some planet someplace, anyone can rise up uh, and through the choices they make, make a difference in the galaxy. And that to me is a fantastic expression of hope. We all have the opportunity through the choices we make to make a difference. We can make choices. Those choices have consequences, but those choices can matter. That's awesome. Scott, thank you so much for joining us uh, on Potathon 2021 as we uh, work with other fan podcasts to raise funds for Make-A-Wish. Um, we know that Disney has had a long history of of love for uh, for everybody over at Make-A-Wish. And so thank you for taking some time with us today. Oh, anytime. It is, a, it is an organization that I am incredibly proud to help out in any way that I can. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for, the, for what you're doing. What an awesome opportunity mm-hmm. to interview yeah. uh, him. What was your favorite part of the interview? I mean, I, I don't know if I, we may have stopped the recording at this point, but what was really cool is he took time to to talk to both Nathan and I about you know our, our degrees and like what we're getting mm-hmm. into and, and and studying and how important it can be and how it's important not only Disney but like Nathan he went up to Nate and was talking about how sound is something that's not a lot of people think of but it makes or breaks a scene and stuff and how he's talking to me about engineering and how important that is obviously for being an Imagineer um, so that was really neat that he took that time mm-hmm. to, to talk yeah, to both of us cool. what about you, guy. Nate? I loved how he just himself is a fan we talked mm-hmm. about that and I loved what he said about just like watching the people um after the ride and everything because after a certain time of us going so much we started to watch the yeah. people too and it's always just an amazing experience seeing people going off of rise of resistance and oh, just yeah. being like oh my gosh that's so amazing my favorite part of i think that whole ride is when we're on the transport right and we're, we're flying around and they're waiting for the other so everybody lines hold on, up hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. you're not going to spoil this for anybody that hasn't done it so they okay. just told that right, back all right, all right. <laughs> i saw that word you knew that was going exactly to. yeah i know what you're saying uh but we're not going to talk about that and if you've been <laughs> on it a couple of times you know exactly what we're talking about too so um that's yeah it was cool it was just so much fun to to have somebody that i mean honestly my my thought process as an adult is when somebody that has that much responsibility on them is will take uh, a few minutes uh, to talk to uh, three Star Wars geeks yeah, um, on a podcast. Um, and you know why he did it. And he said it at the end. He loves what they do at Make-A-Wish. He's always going to support that. So it was awesome. I mean, um, and then just, you know, talking about Galaxy's Edge, it kind of mm-hmm. made me a little bit nostalgic. Uh, we love living here in Alabama. We've made some great friends. They're amazing people. Everything here is awesome. And I think that for us, maybe the the one thing that we truly miss about Orlando is Walt Disney World and yep. going to Galaxy's Edge um, <laughs> and all that. So um, here's hoping we get a chance to return sometime soon. Um, who knows? Um, all right. Anything else you guys want to talk about? Anything else? Yeah. Star Wars Rogue Squadron has been delayed indefinitely, <laughs> uh, which doesn't mean it's like canceled or anything. It's just they don't know when it's going to be released. Right it's now. been delayed yeah, for whatever reason. We don't know exactly why. It was a big. I, I, it was a surprise and, not, and kind of not <laughs> a surprise, too. So, yes. And big screen leaks. Jordan Mason and Adam Frazier all claim that Lucasfilm is developing an older public movie to release as early as December 2023. Interesting. Yeah. And this delay of Rogue Squadron is kind of telling. <laughs> <laughs> is uh interesting in light of that and those guys are not mike zero by the way or we they have are discovered not, no. they're pretty legitimate um uh scoopers we'll just have uh, to wait for friday yeah hopefully we'll find out something friday that's what everybody's thinking and then we were talking about galactic star cruiser and and all of that with uh scott trowbridge uh star wars galactic star cruiser has sold out its first three months already that's incredible uh, especially then, as expensive yeah, as it yeah, is exactly. wondering how these people have the money to go yeah they're so, selling kidneys <laughs> yeah it's pretty awesome so 
Um, all right. Um, that's going to do it for this week. I'm excited about Friday's interview. I want you guys to check it out. Pete Fletcher was the, was one of the driving forces behind Potathon 2021. And so, you know, he's a good guy. Um, <laughs> if he's going to be a part of that and uh, the conversation that he, he, we've had him on the show before, we love having him on the show, but this one was special for a different reason because it's really about being a dad in star Wars. And he has experienced that both as a child growing up with a dad who loved star Wars, something that I didn't get to experience. Mm. Um, and also as a dad now who has kids that love Star Wars. Mm. So it was a really fun conversation um, with that. Please make sure you guys check out uh, cufflinks.com um, and use the, the uh, code Tatooine15 for anything that you purchase there. You can save 15% on that. Uh, you guys um, are awesome. And we just want to take a second to say that because we love doing this podcast. And so thank you guys so much uh, for listening to Tattooing Sons, a pop culture podcast. If you had a good time listening, it'd be awesome if you could share this with your friends. Yeah, please. Share, share the love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Share, share the love. Um, and of course, the show is only a small part of the Tattooing Sons world. So if you really like us that much, uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter to get in on all the action and uh, keep up to date on everything we got going on at TattooingSons.com. Yeah. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss our next episode and remember that if you drop us a review at podchaser.com slash Tatooine Sons uh, we will make a donation in your honor to one child to help a child living in extreme poverty all right uh, that's going to do it this week uh, anything else you guys would like to say may the force be with you may the force be with you may the force be with you always this party's over I like that monkey don't get technical with me Yep, yep.